Today we will hear from Catherine Wetton, is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, and Eleanor Williams, who appear on behalf of the Department of Health. This is the third day of hearings in the hearing block number five, where we are primarily hearing from government witnesses on the priority areas of child protection and criminal justice. Before we start today's hearing, I would like now, now to invite Commissioner Hunter to give a welcome to country and acknowledgement. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to acknowledge that we are my ancestral lands, the lands of the Wurundjeri, pay my respects to elders, past and present, and acknowledge those that went before us to give us voice here today that we're able to speak our truths. I still also want to honour those um, of our children currently in the child protection system, those uh, our men and women that are currently incarcerated in the, in the systems and acknowledge their pain and hurt um, and the injustices that have, have put them where they are today. Um, may Bunjil watch over us as we conduct Aboriginal business. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hunter. Council, may I have appearances, please? Sarala Fitzgerald, Council Assisting. Commissioners, my name is Elizabeth Bennett and I appear with Ms Carly Marks on behalf of the witnesses. Welcome. Thank you. If the Commission pleases, I'll now call today's witnesses, Catherine Wetton and Eleanor Williams. Uh, I understand uh, that before making a truth declaration, you would each like to acknowledge country. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on today, the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my deep and seer respects to Elders past and present and those emerging. I'd like to acknowledge too those who've given evidence before today, particularly Elders, and acknowledge their extraordinary strength and courage in sharing their testimonies. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank each of the Commissioners for the opportunity to appear today. Thanks. Thank you, and I'd, um, and thank you for the opportunity. I'd also like to acknowledge we're meeting on um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people today, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to all um, First Peoples in the room today and our colleagues from Department of Health as well. Uh, Ms Wetton, do you undertake to give truthful evidence to the Uruk Justice Commission today? I do. Uh, and Eleanor Williams, do you undertake to give truthful evidence to the Uruk Justice Commission today? I do. Uh, Ms Wetton, you're the Departmental Secretary uh, of Mental Health and Wellbeing. Could you explain your professional background and qualifications to the Commissioners? Thank you, Ms Fitzgerald. Um, I'm the Deputy Secretary of Mental Health and Wellbeing in the Department of Health. Um, I've worked in the Victorian Public Service for just a bit over 20 years. Um, have an arts degree with a honours in psychology, a postgraduate um, diploma in French an Executive Masters of Public Administration. And my time in the public service, I've worked across departments of Premier and Cabinet, Education um, and, and now Health. Thanks. Uh, and Ms Williams, uh, will you do the same? Explain your professional background. So uh, I'm the Executive Director of Strategy and Policy in the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division of the Department of Health. Um, I hold a Masters of Public Policy and Management uh, and a Masters of evaluation. Um, and similarly to Ms Wetton, I've uh, worked in Department of Premier and Cabinet um, and for the past uh, about six years I've worked in Department of Health and before that Department of Health and Human Services when the departments were def uh, combined. Uh, and the department has provided a statement that covers themes of mental health, social and emotional wellbeing, the use of alcohol and other drugs and public intoxication. Yes. Uh, although it's been signed by the Secretary, uh, Professor Wallace, the opinions expressed in the statement are representative of the department and in particular the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division. Is that right? Correct. They have been informed by staff's first-hand professional experience and observations and by data and information produced or provided by subject matter experts. Is that right? That's correct. Um, before we um, hop into the... Um, substance of your evidence. I might just mention one thing about timing and breaks. Um, I understand that at some point today at about 12.30 there may be some building works upstairs and so we had uh, a, 
an, an ideal finishing time of 12.30. Um, so, Commissioners, normally we would have a, um, a break for morning tea, and I thought um, uh, my understanding is that it might be appropriate, given we do have um, somewhat of a hard finish, um, we might just play it by year where that break happens and how long it is. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, uh, we'll start with the... Um, uh, the statement. Ms Wetton, I ask you to confirm that the contents of that statement are true and correct. They are. And I'll tender uh, the statement at the end of the evidence, Commissioners. A paragraph 16 of the statement, um, the Department accepts that ongoing and systemic racism and discrimination and intergenerational trauma caused by colonisation and dispossession impact significantly on First Peoples' health and well-being and are an intrinsic consequence of historic and ongoing government policies and practices. So the department accepts that government policies are currently giving rise to racism, discrimination and trauma. I accept that. Uh, the department says that health-related factors drive involvement with the child protection system, but also that involvement with child protection itself negatively impacts on the health of families. Uh, is that the department's position? It is. Uh, and I should say, there are two of you um, in the witness box, and I am, uh, as I understand it, as the, um, the deputy secretary, um, uh, you will be able to address some of the more overarching issues and that as a subject matter expert uh, in particular areas, Ms Williams will address some more of the detail. But as between you, you can feel free to answer the questions you have um, more informed knowledge about. Um, the department also states that involvement in the child protection system is both driven by parental mental health issues and contributes further to mental illness due to the impact of family separation and childhood trauma. Is that right? Yes. Um, it, so you accept that it is a vicious cycle to which the system itself contributes? It is. Uh, and um, it seems like the current child protection system operates in a way that potentially creates more work for itself. Do you think that is the case? Yes, I would agree that's the case. Uh, and do you accept that reducing the involvement of First Nations people in the child protection system cannot be done by the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing alone, uh, that health and mental health um, feed into the involvement with that system? Yes, health um, certainly plays a role in that prevention space. And yeah. that is your department's area of responsibility? Yes. Um, the statement says at paragraph 19 that more than 60% of the children reviewed as part of Task Force 1000 came to the attention of child protection as a result of parental mental health issues in combination with other risk factors and that parental mental illness was found to be a common reason why many children could not be returned. Um, the Commission has heard from a large number of Aboriginal community controlled organisations or ACOs and what is striking is that they look at all of the issues facing the human before them, all of the issues that are contributing um, to the problem. Do you accept that the way the government divides up its departments often doesn't allow any one of them to fully address the causes of a person's problem behaviour? Government does structure itself in a way that means that there are um, portfolios with specific responsibilities. I would say that there are either through monitoring governance and reporting that there are ways of bringing things together. But your um, first statement that yeah, the structures um, do mean that you have pretty separate responsibilities. And as you say, although the department accepts in its statement that there are significant areas of intersectionality, it is a barrier that the health system and the child protection system and the criminal system are all sitting in separate silos, if you like, in different government departments with separate budgets 
and each of them will only deal with their part of the problem because that is all they're authorised to do. Portfolio lines do then set up the authorisations for um, responsibility. I think then there's a role for senior public service staff to collaborate and come together. Um, but your, the, your first statement that um, the way things are structured mean that you're authorised to perform particular um, functions. My, that my statement is um, correct. Yes. <laughs> um, at paragraph 32 of the statement, uh, the work of Ballot Derndern Centre of Excellence in Social and Emotional Wellbeing is discussed. Um, and the model is ensuring that there isn't a wrong door for Aboriginal people to access support. Uh, and uh, do you agree that this is in response to this, the, the very siloed nature of government, that it can create wrong doors for Aboriginal people with mental health or drug and alcohol problems in both the child protection and the criminal justice systems? The Ballot Dern Dern Centre has um, been, uh, is being um, developed and established in, directly in response to the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. And so one of the key drivers there is that, uh, that the Royal Commission found and why it recommended the Ballot Dern Dern Centre was that there should be no wrong door for First Peoples to be able to access health and wellbeing services. And so that whether that th be through ACOs or ATROs or whether that be through mainstream health services, that's, that was the reference to, to no wrong door. And is it a response to the fact that Aboriginal, there have been a lot of wrong doors for Aboriginal people looking for help in the mental health system? Yes. Um, moving to child protection, we know that a contributor to some First Nations parents losing their children is their mental health or drug and alcohol issues. Uh, is it right to say that there is a, a huge demand for alcohol and other drug services in Victoria, more than can be met at any one time? The current alcohol and other drug service system is under very significant strain at the moment. Are there waiting lists for these services? I believe there are waiting lists for those services. Um, this might be too much detail for you, and I'm not sure, Ms Williams, um, whether it's something you may like to address, but if I decided today that I was ready to do something about a very severe drug or alcohol addiction that I had, what would I need to do to get into, uh, for example, a residential rehab? I'll try and step through the, the, um, the, um, the way people come into the AOD service system. So there are a number of ways of accessing treatment, care and support. That can be either through call to direct line, it's a 24-7 number, um, where you can call to self-refer. Um, you could also be referred through a general practitioner or if you were in contact with the criminal justice system, for example, you might be referred uh, into the AOD um, service system. That would then um, mean that you were in an intake and then an assessment phase. And when you're assessed, there is priority given to um, some um, factors for, for a person's life. So for example, if you are um, being assessed for treatment, if you are um, First Peoples, if you are involved um, in the child protection system, or if you are on a family reunification order, so the court has asked you um, to um, seek treatment, so that there are some things, or you have a mental illness, so there are some factors that mean that you're prioritised for service. And um, how does that prioritisation work in practice? Um, if, assuming I was on a fro, um, how long would it take, uh, sorry, a family reunification order, how long would it take um, once from that assessment stage for me to get into a residential rehab service when I'm being prioritised? I'd need to take that on notice about how long, just to perhaps have some data about what it, um, how long that wait time might be. Um, so I could come back to you on that if it would but assist. Excuse me, when you're getting that data, could you provide us with data on not just the priority, but how much if somebody doesn't, I mean, I could see that most of those people would actually probably meet all four, do the priorities add up for your First Peoples and you're on a family reunification order, does that up your priority or is it just all equal, What is it the same? But also how long would it take if somebody 
wasn't on one of those reunification orders. Yeah. On, on average, I'm sure you've got some figures for average for the last year. We can get that. Thanks, Commissioner Walter. Um, given that children are still being uh, removed because of parental, mental health and drug and alcohol reasons, do you accept that um, some parents are still not getting the help they need within the necessary time frames? I'm not sure of the definition of a necessary time frame, but I would um, would say that there would be people who would still have trouble getting the care and treatment that they need. Are you aware that the legislation only gives a parent two years to sort themselves out before the permanency objective requires uh, that a, um, if they can't be with their parents, at that point it requires they be permanently placed with someone else? I'm aware. So, um, thinking about all of the intersecting issues uh, that some First Nations parents have, do you accept that it can take a long time to address and resolve those issues, particularly if we're thinking about mental health and alcohol and drug addiction? It can take some time, once people do access treatment and care, um, to resolve their, their challenges. I would say that's a very individual thing, so for each person who might be accessing AOD treatment, that it's hard to put an exact time frame, but it may be less than two years, and in some cases it would be more. Yes. So you accept that um, the issues cannot always be resolved in two years? Not always. Uh, and um, even though uh, people on a family reunification order are prioritised, there is no guarantee that those people will get what they need in time, is there? I don't believe there's a guarantee. Uh, and um, sorry, um, Ms. Fitzgerald, can I just? So we're saying that basically, that we're saying that parents can't get their children back if they can't access drug and alcohol rehab or detox or whatever that wording you want to use, because they may one may not fit the criteria, and we have heard evidence of that with in in, in custody and outside, and so the system isn't working correctly or have long wait lists. So children may go on permanent care orders because they can't access what they require. Is that correct? If they can't access what they require, that could then yeah, lead to um, a challenge with that family and the child not being able to um, be with their family. If it's a court order that they have to go to detox but they can't get in, then that leaves the child in out-of-home care. That would be correct. Can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, as the Royal Commission uh, found historically, um, uh, people needing mental health treatment care or support experienced uh, wide, widespread and profound difficulty uh, over many decades uh, in, in obtaining that support. The Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system found that, and the language of the Royal Commission was that it had catastrophically failed Victorians. Yes. And there's certainly parts of the um, Royal Commission's inquiry that go precisely to the support that wasn't there yes. or hasn't been there and isn't there um, always for First Peoples. And uh, it's, um, it's the case, uh, isn't it, uh, that among the Victorians that the system catastrophically failed... Uh, were a very large number of Aboriginal people. First Peoples are overrepresented in a lot of the um, um, materials around um, that they do face more psychological distress, they may be less likely to seek help, um, and yes, so they are disproportionately um, affected. And, and, and the, uh, the catastrophic failure uh, with, with respect to them uh, would have significantly contributed to difficulties within families where it was parents that it was uh, that, that, that were needing support that they could not obtain? It absolutely would have. Uh, and it would follow, wouldn't it, that the catastrophic, catastrophic failure uh, over a long period of time uh, would have contributed significantly uh, to the incidence of trial, child removal of Aboriginal people from their families? Yes. Thank you. Can 
Can I just follow on from Commissioner Bell's point? So substance abuse and addiction and mental health, so they continue, as we can see, to be punished in a, in a punitive way. Um, would you say health is the key driver for offending, yet it's not our number one priority? I think it's a contributing factor. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd say it's the key factor, but it's certainly a very important factor uh, in people's lives and then for their interaction with um, child protection and criminal justice. So Would you agree that health, sh health should be a core response to those issues? It should absolutely be a core response. In your witness statement, in the department's witness statement, rather, um, at paragraph 63, there is a discussion about the need to better address some of the contributing factors identified uh, in your response through investment and prevention. Um, and um, that whole paragraph um, uh, is very much reflecting, in fact, what the community has been saying for some time, that there is a need for prevention and to address contributing factors uh, to child protection involvement, um, and the department accepts that. Yes. Um, uh, two of those contributing factors uh, to child protection involvement are domestic violence and drug and alcohol addiction. That's accepted? Yes. Uh, and done properly, uh, the public health response um, to public drunkenness could therefore directly uh, address some of the lead causes of First Nations peoples getting caught up in the child protection system. It, it could have that dual impact. It could have that effect related. Um, the health response to public drunkenness will involve outreach services being provided to intoxicated people and those services can make referrals to other services. Has child protection been thought about as one of the outreach services or referrals that might be made as part of the health response? I might ask Ms Williams in a moment to go to the child protection point um, and our work there, but before we do start talking about public intoxication reform. I did just want to acknowledge it's a sensitive area and I'd like to acknowledge that we are talking about the very terrible circumstances of the passing of Auntie Tanya Day um, and just how distressing those circumstances are. I'd like to express my deepest condolences to the Day family and recognise that some of what we might talk about in responding on this issue could be triggering um, for some people. So. Um, and also just like to acknowledge the very strong advocacy over a very long time for this um, overdue reform. And that without that family's advocacy, we might still be waiting for reforms. That's right. Um, yes, so the question was about uh, whether child protection has been thought about as one of the outreach services that might be provided in the response. So the, um, it it is possible that child protection could be in there, but actually the outreach and sobering services proposed under the public intoxication reforms are a very brief intervention. And so it's more likely that somebody would be referred on to another service, like a homelessness service, a family violence service, or a mental health service, that then could potentially have an involvement with child protection, but it's very unlikely from the brief intervention, the point in time where someone was found publicly intoxicated that it would have any direct referral onto child protection. Uh, and it, it is overall the department's view uh, that public intoxication should be treated as a health issue. Absolutely. Uh, and to date it has been treated as a law and order issue and rather than helping, uh, you accept that um, to date the state has criminalised and imprisoned First Nations peoples. Yes. Um, the Department of Health has provided an apology in its statement to First Peoples who have died in custody. Uh, who did not receive a health-based response to public intoxication. Yes. And implicit in that, in, in, in that apology is an acceptance that if those people had received a public health response, they may not have died. That's right. And because of delays in implementation, uh, at this moment, First Nations peoples can still be arrested by police for being intoxicated. Yes. Uh, in public, I should say, <laughs> and um, and this is at a time when the state accepts that this this is the wrong thing to do. Yes. Uh, in fact, Parliament, the people elected by Victorians to represent them, voted to abolish that crime from.
from November 2022. That's right? Yes. And um, it was at the behest of the executive that the crime stayed in place for an additional year. Is that right? Yes. Um, and at, at a, a page, sorry, a paragraph 105 of the statement, it's noted that delays were largely associated with COVID-19. What were the other causes of delay? Thank you for the question. It's definitely the case that the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed significantly to the delays that we've experienced in the decriminalisation of public intoxication and, and standing up the health-led response. There, are, there have been some other uh, challenges as well that have um, contributed and, and some of it a bit driven by the pandemic. So we've had some significant challenges in workforce recruitment uh, in our trial sites. We've also found that the construction sector has had some delays where there's been a need to fit out a building to um, enable a sobering service for the trial sites as well as then the planning system um, and the time that it takes for that. And also one of the things that we've found as we've undertaken the work in this reform is that the service model, we needed to do more work on the service model to develop the trial sites than we'd anticipated when we first set out. So that we're very focused on that the trial sites get up and running very quickly, but it's become apparent that we needed to do quite a bit of service model design work to even have the trial sites stand up while then also working on the statewide response. Uh, and I'm not sure who this is a question for, but um, do you accept that it was known by those making the decision about whether to delay that removing these laws risked further Aboriginal deaths in custody? Yes, that was acknowledged, that the risk would remain for that time. Uh, and the government knew that this could be the result of the extension, didn't they? Yes. Uh, if I could um, have one of the... Ask, are you finished with the trial sites or...? or... For a little while, so oh, definitely. I was just going to ask, what's the current state of the trial sites now? How, how developed are they? So all four trial sites are operational. So there's one trial site in Yarra, which is based in uh, quite near here in Gertrude Street. There's one in Greater Shepherd, or there's, there's services operating in Greater Shepherd and in Greater Dandenong and in Castlemaine, which is in Mount Alexander's Shire. Um, all sites are now considering their transition planning because we are in the process of moving across to the statewide model and the sites for the, for the statewide model are different than the trial sites. So they're all operating... In, in different um, sort of formations because they were testing different models, so different levels of demand and different demographic profiles in each location. Um, and then they're all working on how they'll stand down by November to transition into the statewide model. So the 7th of November is a definite date. It's not going to be another 12 months delay because the trial sites have taken a lot longer to get going. That's right. There's been agreement that the statewide model will be established alongside the trial sites, so we're continuing to learn to the, about and from the trial sites right up to the moment of statewide implementation. Will there be a public report on the evaluation of the trial sites before the 7th of November? There will. So the, the evaluation is due to report in August. So an interim evaluation was undertaken last year in November. But the trial sites weren't up then? Yarra was operating in almost full um, capacity. Yeah. That's right. So that one's primarily an evaluation of the Yarra site. Commissioners. Uh, if I could ask the operator to bring up DJCS.006, no, I think it's 000, it's a typo, 0006, uh, 0010284, which is the government response to the report of the expert reference group on public drunkenness. And for the witnesses, that should be tab seven. Uh, thank you, operator. And uh, 
Could we now move to uh, I think we can stay on page one. Uh, and if we could move down to the bottom half of the page. Uh, in the government's response to the expert reference group on public drunkenness, a commitment is made to decriminalising public drunkenness and implementing a public health model to ensure that those who are intoxicated in public can access the health care and support they need. Is this access to additional services or uh, that are being put on, or uh, is this simply referring into the same pool of existing alcohol and other drug services? The government's commitment in that statement was certainly around having a dedicated um, health-led response to um, people found publicly intoxicated. And so that is the create. Although the word access is used, it's not just access. It will provide new services. There are new services as part of that health-led model. Uh, and um, at paragraph fifty-six of um, the department's statement, you do discuss uh, the challenges um, that have faced you uh, in this response. Our models, modelling suggests that 2,500 more workers in the public mental health system will be needed over the next three and a half years uh, just to stabilise the system and implement currently funded reforms. Uh, and at paragraph 59 of your statement, it's confirmed that this additional recruitment must occur in a system where there are, there are already widespread vacancies. Is that right? Yes. And so given there are not enough people to fill the current roles in the public mental health system, where is it planned to get 2,500 more from? There's a significant piece of work underway in response to the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system to build the mental health and wellbeing workforce. And so that 2,500 number um, that's there that we've modelled um, we've been working on a series of initiatives and there's a mental health and wellbeing workforce strategy. And again, Ms Williams might have some more detail she'd like to um, provide. But um, there's a focus on building the pipeline, so more training and education of people. It takes some time to um, uh, have people reach the certain qualifications to join the sector, as well as then seeking to retain the existing workforce as well. But the, the pandemic has had a big impact on the health system overall including mental health and wellbeing system and including um, the workforce. Uh, and um, further down on that page, um, the, uh, I might just read it from here, the government acknowledges that adequate resourcing is a key factor in the successful implementation of these reforms. Would you accept that adequate resourcing is the key factor in the successful implementation of the reforms? I think it's one of the key factors. Do you accept that it is more important than all the other key factors? That successful, uh, that, sorry, adequate resourcing will end up being the most important of all the factors in, in the success of this reform? The reason I say it's a key factor is there are some other things that are needed and I'll just go to one example is that public intoxication and decriminalising it means a significant culture change in our community as well. So I think in terms of there are lots of aspects to this, there's definitely a key factor is the resourcing of a health led model. But I do think there are other things about how we educate the broader community to see that public intoxication is a public health issue. It's not a criminal justice issue. So that people don't find themselves thinking that the first thing that they would do is call the police in, um, if they do come across someone who's intoxicated in public. So I just pull that out as one example. But I do think that it is important that resourcing is very important, but there are other aspects as well. And is it right that the department advised the rest of government, that there would be significant implementation risks if government supported a 12-month deferral without adequate funding to enable immediate commissioning of statewide services? We did. Uh, and was funding provided to enable the immediate commissioning of safe, uh, 
statewide services yes, at that time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, if I can take you back uh, to the 2nd of June last year, um, is it right that um, around early June or uh, at, at perhaps at the end of May, uh, the funding for public intoxication reforms was only confirmed to 30 June, less than 28 days before the money ran out. I haven't put that question very well, sorry, but um, is it right that a, a, a funding decision on um, trial sites uh, and funding the public intoxication reforms uh, was um, only made 28 days or less than a month before the funding was about to run out. I think that's... Also, Ms Fitzgerald, just checking, are we able to answer that question? That is a question on notice. Isn't that something here which is not? Okay. Well, we might come back to that question. Thank you. Um, uh, so it, it is true to say, though, that government was aware that this risked that its funding decisions in general and the the extent <coughs> to which they how long they were, was risking staff attrition and uncertainty for trial sites. That's definitely the case, yeah. Uh, and um, without a funding decision, the Department of Health, um, w without those funding decisions, you can't fund things like fit out activities to establish trial sites or allocate funding for standalone Aboriginal service responses, can you? No, that the way that budgets are appropriated to departments are for particular um, projects or services and so we did need those funding decisions to be able to implement um, the reforms. So if, if, even if you have plans for things and some money lying around for other things, you can't just use it, uh, you can't appropriate it of your own accord for those things? Not without government's approval. Uh, and the statement speaks of recruitment difficulties for the trial sites. Do you accept that most people don't want a job where they don't know if it's going to exist in a month's time? Very challenging to recruit people with such short time frames, yes. Uh, and I will leave that question for later. Uh, Ms Fitzgerald, can I just... You're our second lot of witnesses from the government and this is the second time we're hearing that funding and resourcing is a problem. I want the state to remember that our kids are still being removed and our people are still dying in custody and it's not good enough. You guys hold the purse strings. I just want to make that really clear. Thank you. Uh, now... Um, Commissioner Walter was asking some questions about trial sites uh, and um, the ability, uh, the extent to which the trial sites uh, will be ready. Uh, I just wanted to step you through in a little bit more detail where each of the trial sites are at and what services are being provided there. Um, Council, this screen is scrambled. Um, we can't see it. I think they're onto it. Thank you, Commissioner. And when you're done, you can take down that reference. Uh, an interim evaluation of the trial sites took place from October 2022, is that right? The evaluation started earlier than that, but it reported um, draft report in October 2022 and then a final interim report 
It's only on the Yarra trial site. That's right. And the, it did include some reflections on the, um, the stand-up of the other sites. So it was looking at the implementation. It was speaking to the other sites as well about where they were up to and, and trying to understand what was behind um, it taking longer than expected at the other sites as well. Right. So the evaluation hasn't evaluated the trial because the trial is not actually was not fully operational at that point. The, the interim evaluation only looked at, at the Yarra site in terms of the sort of throughput and what was happening, activity at the site, but the final uh, evaluation in August of this year will look at all sites. Uh, and so is it fair to say... So, so there will be an evaluation in August? That's right. Right. And um, you, you have mentioned in the statement um, that at paragraph 121, that one of the insights from that interim evaluation that took place in late 2022 was the importance of positive, proactive engagement across all relevant stakeholders, including Victoria Police. Uh, is Victoria Police uh, one of... Oh, sorry. The importance of positive, proactive engagement across all relevant stakeholders is the quote and those stakeholders include Victoria Police. Did you have, up to that point, positive, proactive engagement from Victoria Police? Been working very closely with Victoria Police throughout the development of all of the reforms. Um, they're part of our governance arrangements. We work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, and they have continually expressed a keenness to see these reforms implemented as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just finish off this topic and then um, I have a proposal for how to go back to my previous questions. I'm pleased to say I'm using one of Her Majesty's counsel as my junior. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll just see if we can fi finish off that topic in a second but, and avoid any problems. Um, uh, in um, uh, the... Uh, public, oh sorry, I might withdraw that and just go back to those questions now. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, around the 2nd of June 2022, uh, and this is, as I understand it, just before um, uh, I'll withdraw that. Um, at that time, and in general, uh, did you have enough time? to properly prepare for the public intoxication reforms? I would say that throughout we've been working towards, we've known our um, timelines and we talked earlier about the deferral date and that um, so that the timeline had been delayed. We've been working with our colleagues across government the whole way to develop, uh, to implement the trial sites, to develop the statewide model and that includes regular conversations with our colleagues across government and in preparation for briefing government. So I think while there are times where decisions come at particular points, that there's no surprise to our colleagues and government about what we'd be seeking, what we think we need to implement the reforms. But, but um, was there a funding delay that impacted on your ability to take action on, on the plans that you had developed? I'm not sure I'd characterise it as a funding delay, but I would say that decisions are made at particular points and that there are times where decisions are taken um, when it might be getting relatively close to really us really needing to know um, what funding would be provided for us to be able to yes, take the next Yes, and I steps. should... I, I, I might ask that a different way um, rather than there being a funding delay because it might have always been planned to make a decision at that time. Was the... Did the... The timing of funding decisions uh, impact on your ability to take action as quickly as you wanted to? I don't believe it did, but Ms Williams, it... No, I don't think so. So it, we were seeking for funding to be released from contingency, so we knew that the funding was committed and it was just seeking for it to be released. So we were still able to give those trial sites assurance that the funding would be provided, that we just needed to go through the process. Yes, but am I right in saying that all of the employees at those trial sites had a, an employment contract that was about to 
to fall off a cliff w within a month? No. Certainly the, the funding, some of the funding challenges related to our team in the Department of Health um, and the timeframes that we had before we could commit for our staffing. But was it for the trial sites? My understanding is at the trial sites, so most of those, or all of those trial site providers deliver some kind of alcohol and other drug services already and most staff were on contracts related to, um, were already on, on contracts with those organisations. So while it was... Um, potentially a challenge for a small number of staff. Most, most staff would have had uh, positions with those services that were, that were longer term, that wouldn't have run out at that point. Uh, and um, if I can just take you now to where we were going to go before, which is, sorry. Um, this is an, another issue I'll have to deal with creatively. Um, Do you understand that it was a requirement, um, if we can just step to what we're told publicly, and one of those things is, um, could um, the operator please bring up uh, DOH.0003 dot triple zero three dot triple zero one dot zero two five five which is seeing the clear light of day uh, sorry it is a um Part of seeing the clear light of day. Uh, now, uh, the recommendation of the uh, expert reference group in relation to the uh, the public health first response, uh, which is set out here, was that the primary first responders should be personnel from health or community services organisations such as outreach services including existing outreach programs associated with homelessness services, alcohol and other drugs services and Aboriginal community controlled organisations. Uh, and is it right to say that the government's overall response to the report was to, su to support that approach based on increasing access to health and social services as the first response? I'd say that in... Um committing to deliver on the expert reference group's report, it was about developing um, a health-led, a specific health-led model to public intoxication. I think just in your statement that it, through some of those services, so through outreach and through the sobering centres, there may be then access to other social services, but that the state committed to um, implementing a health-led response specifically for public intoxication. Uh, and um, Yuruk uh, was given a presentation uh, and I cannot tell you which department it was from, on the 19th of January 2023. And if I could just bring that up, it is BAL5.1000.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001
Uh, and um, if the operator can take us two slides on to page 12, 0012. Um, in that presentation, we were told that the new health-led service model will provide coverage to approximately 82% of Victoria's Aboriginal population. Um, and so, am I right in calculating that leaves 18% of First Nations peoples that will not be covered by a first response of the kind recommended by the expert reference group? That's correct. Uh, and because of this, do you accept that there are residual health risks for this 18% in situations where no family, friends or support services are available? I accept there are residual risks. If we may, Ms Williams might be able to talk about some of the, the numbers that we're talking about. I think to Commissioner Hunter's point earlier that we're talking about percentages, but actually we're talking about people in communities. So if we may, Ms Williams might be able to elaborate. Yeah, so um, you'll see in that presentation we talk about the fact it's 82% of Victoria's Aboriginal population, but it covers 98% of where the offences have traditionally occurred. So we've very much tried to um, focus, the attempt, focus the efforts of the health-led response in locations where it's most likely that there would be people um, picked up. And so in the majority of local government areas in Victoria, there's less than five cases of public drunkenness picked up in a year, and so it's very hard to get a full health-led response in those local government areas where the numbers are so small, because it would mean a worker employed 24/7 to cater for you know potentially around five people in the year. So that's what we've tried to do is really concentrate the health services in the areas of greatest need, which is what was rec recommended by the expert reference group. They said to use that that offence data as the focus for where health services are provided. So if you're one of those five people, what response do you get? So it's still, um, it, that's called the secondary response and that's what the Department of Premier and Cabinet um, worked with the emergency services to prepare. And so it will still be Victoria Police or Ambulance Victoria attending in those locations. But I remember one of the, the really important things that we've I guess, achieved through these reforms is that there's no additional powers for Victoria Police so that you will not be charged and you'll be not taken to a cell if Victoria Police attend, but they can support you to get to friends and family. So friends and family are still absolutely an option and Victoria Police are revisiting their operational guidelines to work on things like referrals to other services where appropriate in those locations where there's not a health-led re response 24-7 operating. And is it right that um, the reason Ambulance Victoria and Victoria Police are the key secondary responders um, is because the core parameter for the secondary response was that there was no additional funding to be dedicated to that secondary response. There was no dedicated funding for that secondary response but it relies heavily on the existing um, operational um, aspects of Victoria Police and Ambulance Victoria and that given that they are often the first responders to people whether it's a health or community safety risk and so it was about relying on their um, current skills and um, operational practices. Yes but is it fair to say um, I, I'm not asking why Victoria Police weren't paid anymore I'm saying the reason that VicPol and Ambulance Victoria were chosen is because there was no money to pay anyone to do the secondary response. Right? I wouldn't say one, that. Yeah, so one, one thing that was done is there was a pretty extensive mapping of what services are available in those communities in terms of 24-7 community services are available. And we spent a lot of time doing what we were calling market testing, which is just jargon for talking to community services about would you be willing to um, find a way. And most of those services says, said they're absolutely at capacity and they wouldn't be able to extend even necessarily with additional funding to providing a 24-7 service, particularly if it involved transport, because it's such a big step up from where like regional rural community services are, are up to. And so they were sort of, all, we did explore the other options, but effectively they weren't viable and wouldn't be viable without a really um, significant injection of funds, which would be disproportionate to the sort of issue that they'd be trying to respond to, that, that very small number of people and the small number of incidents. So it was deemed better to work on the cultural change Victoria Police and the Ambulance Victoria in terms of their operational guidelines 
to try and use those services that do have that full state-wide state coverage to make sure people do at least get a response that somebody will come because the community services organisations can't guarantee to be able to scale up in those communities given their existing size and scope. And it's a resourcing issue. Potentially, but it's also a cost-benefit decision in terms of... I know that, sorry, that sounds oh, absolutely terrible. Language, yes. Yeah, sorry, terrible language. Um, but it's the, the level of investment you'd have to do to scale up a community service organisation in a rural or regional setting to be able to provide a 24-7 service for a very small number of people is really challenging. That There's just not an easy answer. So how would how the you state can... respond if there are more Aboriginal deaths in custody uh, in those areas? So I guess the key... I can see that you'd like to speak. Oh, I think, I think as Ms Williams is talking about the capacity of some of those services, so that it would be... We were talking earlier about some of the workforce challenges so that you could provide more resourcing and more funding to those community service organisations in those different towns around Victoria, then you'd have the challenge of um, recruiting more people to, to go and work in them. So I think there's it's not purely a resourcing question as much as really a capacity question as well. I, I know that they are... Sitting here is capacity Possibly. Resources. Well, I think one thing we've certainly learned from... Well, just more generally, I think, in my role in mental health and wellbeing, so... Um, for the reforms we're undertaking in response to the Royal Commission is that even when you apply more funding, it can be very challenging to, for organisations to build their capacity and capability to be able to take on those new services and um, functions. Just, a, 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 just going back to the expert reference group that you were talking about, who sits on that? It had four members. Uh, so it had uh, Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, so Narita Wade, had Helen Kennedy, who was at that stage working at Batcho, had Tony Nicholson from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, and I think Jack Blaney from Victoria, ex Victoria Police, was their Chief Information Officer. Just four, four members. members. And how often did they meet? Their work, their work was undertaken over the course of about a year. I'm not sure they they weren't sort of auspiced by the Department of Health, so I'm not sure about their sort of meeting frequency. Who, who were they all supposed by? Uh, I understand it was Department of Premier and Cabinet. It was set up specifically to lead that piece of work. Um, so it doesn't meet anymore. If it, if it would help, it we It doesn't could. meet anymore. It was um, established to undertake and develop that report that was then provided to government in around August 2020, and I understand it disbanded at that time. Was Ambulance on there? Ambulance Victoria? Anyone? I don't believe... Ambulance Victoria wasn't on it, but they did consult very significantly with um, all um, relevant agencies to do their work. Okay. I'm presuming that that um, group didn't recommend that coverage only be 82% of the state. That was a departmental decision. It's a bit unclear. One of the things they did recommend is that there be on-demand services where the demand didn't justify a 24-7 response. Um, so that's what we've put in the locations where there have been substantial offences occurred, but um, not in areas where there haven't been. Um, so they recommended to be guided by the offence data in terms of setting up the health lead service. Uh, and is it right to say that the funding envelope that you were um, given for these reforms and the amount of funding given has never provided for complete coverage of the health response, the first response? The funding envelope we've been provided would not provide 100% coverage of the state. Commissioners, um, it's 11 and I'm <coughs> halfway through um, my questions um, and um, if you wanted to take a short break, I think we're tracking uh, OK to finish by 12. Can I ask a question and perhaps be answered when we come back? Um, I'm, I'm referring to the um, ballot Marup. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you said already that this, um, your department uh, auspices this, 2017 to 2027. Um, so my question relates to the monitoring, evaluation, reporting of the outcomes and achievement. So that's on page 35, and it says that you will have a detailed evaluation approach uh, with key Aboriginal research evaluation and service delivery organisations uh, and that you'll re be reporting and you'll identify the indicators. I'm a bit surprised they weren't identified before you wrote the report mm -hmm. to monitor progress 
recognising that measuring social and emotional wellbeing is a responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. Can you point us, when we come back from the break, to the documents and reports that have been made based on that and your model of evaluation? We'll do our best to do that. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Walter. No. <coughs> Yeah, shall, shall we return at um, 25 past? 25 past, okay. Thank you. We'll adjourn for the moment, 25 past 11. We'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Some Section 18 claims that had have been made in relation to the documents that are relevant to these witnesses. Um, I had um, mistakenly understood this morning that those issues were resolved uh, and, as it turns out, they are not resolved uh, and, as a result, um, there has been... Um, I've needed to make some adjustments to how I refer to those documents uh, in, in, in the interim until they are resolved. Um, I anticipate that if they're not resolved soon, it will create some real difficulties hearing the evidence tomorrow because I understand senior counsel assisting uh, Mr McAvoy does um, rely very heavily on documents over which claims are made. Um, I just foreshadow that uh, and apologise ahead of time that I may uh, take some time to pick my way through those issues. Um, and um, I, th I think um, it, it, it may possibly mean uh, for these witnesses that there is an, a need um, to ask them to come back on another occasion. Uh, but at this stage, I am just attempting to um, put the questions without raising uh, any concerns about issues that are unresolved. Uh, now... Uh, can I... Excuse me, Council... Um, oh, yes, sorry, Commissioner, <coughs> your question. ...on to my question asked before the break. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Walter. So ballot MARAP um, is a framework with a 10-year aspiration, as, um, as you will well know, with um, having looked at the document. And it does have a number of objectives and short, medium and long-term um, actions and, and objectives. Um, I'm just going to own it on behalf of the department. We have not um, undertaken good monitoring and evaluation. I can see that it is listed. Seriously, after five years, there is no monitoring and evaluation, but it is under your section here, our commitments to enable reform. And this is monitoring and evaluation are key aspects of that. So you're telling me it hasn't been done? So we haven't done it well. I think there's probably been some ad hoc monitoring of particular parts of it. What I would say, though, is that we are very aware of it and we've had lots of feedback from our um, partners um, uh, and hearing it from the Aboriginal controlled community controlled sector. Why and would Aboriginal people in Victoria think you are taking this seriously? <coughs> Five years into a 10 year program, you have not put in the monitoring and evaluation that you promised at the start. So I can understand that um, challenge and I think that uh, what we are trying to do now, having heard that feedback and know that it's not good enough, is that we have, in the Department of Health, we have an Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing Partnership Forum that's co-chaired by the Chair of the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service and also by the Minister for Health. And we've had lots of that feedback from forum members about it not being good enough. So we've developed... Um, we've got a, the forum, and that forum has developed a partnership agreement that's a 10-year aspiration as well. But then to really get into the specifics, the that forum has also... It's currently in draft... Form, but there's a partnership agreement action plan that's a two-year action plan and the idea with that is that then um, that's been developed with those forum members so we see it as part of our um, commitment to self-determination and then just finally getting to the monitoring and evaluation aspect that we're developing a dashboard as well as part of that and that dashboard will be initially developed led by the Department of Health, but will transition to be owned by First Peoples and transition um, to be um, uh, held by VATCHO. Can I, can I... What's the name of the strategy? The Ballot Murrup, or the... Yeah. So it's Ballot Murrup. What does that translate to? That means strong mind mm. in Woi language. Actually, yeah. strong spirit. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I... 
So the point of asking the question is, let's not get too caught up in utilising language. The mob have given and enabled you to use language with good faith that the department would honour its commitments. You know, and I think it's incredibly frustrating that um, our people, you know, come to the table uh, and yet we always are hearing that, you know, government needs more time or that we're, we're evaluate, well, we haven't made um, decent attempts at evaluating strategies and so forth as well. Uh, as I had asked um, uh, previous witnesses before us, w what authority does that forum have? The community members that are ACOs, I think the co-chair you said before was the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service. So what authority do community members or CEOs of these large organisations or organisations that represent our people, what authority do they have in these forums? Keyword authority. I was going to talk about accountability, which you may say is a different thing, mm. but just thinking about the way um, as part of our self-determination agenda in the mm. department, have established the partnership forum and tried to have the most senior decision maker involved as a co-chair through the Minister for Health and then with the chair of VATCHO um, as the, the other, um, as the, as the co-chair and that the idea of the partnership agreement, the partnership agreement action plan and then this dashboard that's being developed the idea is that from that, an accountability point of view to come to those discussions. And so, for example, one of the um, actions that's in this draft action plan is about building cultural safety in the universal health service system. And so the idea would be that we would be asking CEOs of um, mainstream health services to come to the forum when we meet um, and to talk to their progress in delivering on building cultural safety in their services. So, again, a question around authority versus accountability, but the idea that um, those forum members that include some departmental staff and critically our um, ACOs would be there to, to ask those questions and hold people to account. Mm. They have no authority, I think, was Commissioner Lovett's point of view, because they've been, you've just said they've been talking about not evaluating this yet it's still not evaluated in, in five years, as this Commissioner no Walter. There's no accountability on this. Yeah. So this is really not worth the paper it's written on because it's a plan without any accountability. I wouldn't say... How long has the partnership forum been going for? I think it's at least a couple of years now. And pre-COVID, I'd, I'd suspect. I think pre-COVID. Yeah. I'd have to double-check when it... We're now nearly 18 months out of COVID, in a sense. Um, and it was pre-COVID and that went for about two years. So not long after the strategy was released, was it five years ago? And then we've had these forums to over have an oversight mechanism, oversight, not accountability mechanism, oversight mechanism, and yet we still don't have effective monitoring and evaluation. So the authority is no, the answer to the authority question. I think by having the co-chair of the forum be the Minister for Health brings with it a level of authority as the most senior yeah. um, government decision From the maker. Uh, my questioning was about the community coming to the table with authority, having authority back into government beyond the co-chair. I think I've talked about the accountability mechanisms that to really have people come and have to be accountable to the forum members. Mm. But in terms of that authority, I, I appreciate the point that you're making. You accept the point. Appreciate and accept Sorry, the two different things. I, I accept the yeah. point you're making. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, can I ask if this database that you're planning on doing, that's be handed back to the community, you'll hold them accountable. Am I correct? Or who have the authority to hold people accountable to that? It'll be the forum. And that's why I go back to the forum. I um, acknowledge the conversation we've just had about authority, but the idea of having um, the forum be made up of or co-chaired by the Minister for Health alongside <coughs> the chair of VATCHO brings with it that um, 
accountability. Is it Vetro or the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service? I thought it was the health service. Sorry, it's so it's it's actually the chair of Vetro yep. who happens to be the CEO okay. of ours. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And, and and just to be clear to um, this commission, but also people listening in, my question is not to have. Uh, um, uh, comments directed at our community members um, who come to this forum and try to advocate, uh, but it's just so we can understand what authority and who, you know, the decision making around what this looks like as well. We are here to provide systemic recommendations for reform, and this is why we're asking the questions. So I just want to be clear on that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just going back to who's doing what under the um the response, the health response in relation to public drunkenness, and we've been talking about the secondary response, which um, will cover 18 per cent, it is estimated will cover 18 per cent of First Nations peoples, and that that response will be provided by, uh, in part, Victoria Police. Um, I understand you're aware that uh, the um, Victorian Aboriginal community has significant concerns about any part of that response being provided by Victoria Police. Yes. You're aware of that? Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, and do, do you accept that uh, the Aboriginal community are um, not just unhappy about it, they are sceptical about um, getting good outcomes when uh, that role is left to uh, police discretion uh, do you accept that it's up to it will be left up to police discretion whether in any particular instance what is given to uh, Aboriginal people who are intoxicated in public is either the helpful, compassionate, health-based response that is envisaged by the expert reference group or the punitive crime-based response that has been taken to date by Victoria Police. That, do you accept that which of those two First Nations peoples get is a matter of police discretion when it comes to the second response? It's true to say Victoria Police will, as we've talked about earlier, will play a role in a future um, health-led model. One of the things I think it is important to keep um, reminding ourselves is that the offence of public intoxication will be no longer and that is already um, it's been legislated and the commitment is that that be come into place from the 7th of November this year so police will no longer have the power to arrest which means that you will not see um, people um, going into police cells purely for the reason of being publicly intoxicated it does mean that when police um, if they happen to be the first responder in the case of someone found publicly intoxicated, that they will, um, if there is no other community safety risk, they will be using... So there's a degree of discretion, but it's discretion that... I thought I want to speak on behalf of police. It's, a, it's discretion that they use every day. And so there'll be a much bigger focus now on um, what that person needs and if it is about helping them get to a place of safety, which may be contacting friends and family and getting them home, it may be to contact an outreach worker because they think that that person could um, use the support of an outreach team. Um, and uh, it could also be just the, the operational response that police would generally have about using their skills in um, calming a situation, de-escalating, um, that kind of thing. So I think it's not a case that if a police person arrives to someone who's found intoxicated in public that therefore it's a punitive model um, that it still is about all that Victoria Police will still be part of this health-led model. When you say um, the police will be using a discretion that they already use every day to the extent that um, we've heard evidence at Yarook about that very discretion being exercised in a racist way those concerns remain about their response to the public health response, don't they? Their their participation. I can appreciate. I can. I accept that that would be a concern that some people would continue to have. And you're aware that First Nations people have had traumatic interactions with police, and for that reason are unlikely to trust police, even if they take on this new caring role. 
That is the case, yes. Um, there, um, w there is a long history of interactions between police and Aboriginal people that will in fact colour those future interactions. Do you accept that neither side, neither the police force nor the First Nations community can flick a switch and change attitude overnight? I think that's right, that it's impossible to flick a switch on any um, complex um, health-led or social policy type um, reform. I think there is a significant effort that is underway in Victoria Police for through training and cultural change to prepare police for the change to a, to a health-led model. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the broader cultural change to I think about how community the, the, the general Victorian community sees um, public intoxication as a health issue rather than a, um, a justice issue. And one of the key risks that has been identified is that Victoria Police may not translate the public drunkenness framework's proposed approach into operational effect. I think all of the interactions that we've had with Victoria Police and Ms Williams and I are generally working with senior personnel from Victoria Police, that they are very committed to this reform and they're like all of the agencies, um, including ourselves, who are working towards implementing this model from later this year, that they're also undertaking all the necessary preparatory work um, for it to genuinely be a health-led response. Because the success of the secretary response is very much dependent on Victoria Police making real cultural and operational change. Do you, do you accept that and that there is no guarantee that will happen? I accept that and I think it's impossible to give a guarantee but I do think um, that, as I said, Victoria Police are working towards those operational and cultural changes. And are you aware that um, the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service made a submission to Yurook? Uh, recommendation 49 was that Victoria Police must not be first responders in a health response to public intoxication. Uh, and um, in, in having Victoria Police be the only response for 18... Sorry, Victoria Police and Ambulance Victoria... Uh, be the only response for a portion of the Aboriginal community uh, that is um, directly opposed by the Aboriginal community? It would be opposed according to Val's submission, that's right. Yes, that, yeah. uh, that Val's is opposed to it. And you're aware that Victoria Police is concerned, ha has expressed concerns uh, about having to fill service gaps if a public health model is not adequately resourced? Yes, I'm aware of those concerns. You understand that's not a job they want? I think Victoria Police has expressed on a number of occasions, both internally within government and also publicly, that they are, they are concerned about the demand um, that if they are the first responder, and although they might be uh, seeking to contact an outreach team or they may be helping that person get to a place of safety, that they have expressed a concern around the time it might take for those responses to come and maybe um, having to sit with that, that person for that time. Um, it's also part of the model that it, it would not be unreasonable that because it's no longer an offence to be intoxicated in public, that that person may be left in place. That is a legitimate part of this response. And if the police and equally if Ambulance Victoria were the first responder, and they arrived and there is no other emergency, health emergency or significant health risk and not a community safety risk, that that person, um, if um, those first responders think that they're OK, they could leave them in place. And although uh, there is a role envisaged for Victoria Police and Ambulance Victoria in relation to that smaller cohort of people, it's right to say, isn't it, that for 82% of um, First Nations peoples and a large portion of Victorians, 
the first response will now move from Victoria Police to the public health response that has been newly set up? For the most part, yes. It is reasonable that in for the areas where there is um, the dedicated response with outreach services and sobering centres, that people still may call police as the first responder. And so that police may still arrive and same Ambulance Victoria may still arrive to that person, even where there is that dedicated response. But that's where, as I was saying earlier, police or um, Ambulance Victoria would assess that if there's no other community safety risk or health risk, that they may either leave that person in place or contact an outreach worker or try to get that person home. Right. I, I thought we would move now. Sorry to jump Sorry, around. Um, is it ready to go for when that... The, in November 7th? Seven. Seven. Yeah. We is, are. That, is that ready to, to go? Will that be in full swing by November? We're pulling out all stops for it to be ready for November. I might ask Ms Williams to talk, but we're right in the middle of commissioning services. So we're in a market process at the moment to um, bring providers on to deliver those services. Because we're really aware that if that's not ready to go and police or the ambulance have this way that they're not ready for to respond, then that's going to backfire and people aren't when they talk about community education. So this needs to be ready to go by then. Yep. Can I ask also, yes. back to how is it going to be monitored and evaluated and reported so that we can make sure or that Victorian Aboriginal people have, can have faith that this is actually mm. being implemented the way you are intending to implement it and that those 18% are not being um, arrested on other uh, measures like resist police or some other measures. How, how, what's the breadth and authority of the evaluating and monitoring system? I'll ask Ms Williams to talk to that. We've put a lot of thought into that approach. Um, but to your point, Commissioner Hunter, we absolutely know and doing everything that we can to be ready. We know that it's not um, an option not to have that response in place by the 7th of November this year. So just in terms of monitoring and evaluation, there's sort of multiple streams. At the moment, we're pulling together the overarching monitoring and evaluation plan. So that's been um, it's being led by the Centre for Evaluation and Research Evidence in partnership with Urbis and Cox Inner Ridgeway, which is an Aboriginal evaluate, uh, evaluation organisation. Um, there's that overarching evaluation monitoring plan will, will cover both multiple components of the evaluation, plus describe the, um, the governance arrangements that oversee. So in terms, there's two major streams of the evaluation work. So one led by the Department of Health, evaluating the health-led model, and one led by the Department of Justice and Community Safety, who will outsource to an independent evaluator, whose sole job is to focus on the justice impacts of the reforms, to, so particularly to look at if there's any change in offence data over that time. And then there's two sort of governance um, aspects that are currently proposed. So there's um, an implementation monitoring and oversight group, which is um, it's currently the members have been approached, so that's um, predominantly First Peoples and will be First Peoples led. Uh, and then there's also an independent oversight committee, which has been proposed by government, which will particularly look at the first period of implementation to make sure, as you say, Commissioner Hunter, that the implementation is happening in time for November. So both, so the overarching plans in development at the moment, the implementation monitoring and oversight group, the members have been contacted and so that's very close to stand up. We're just working on the differentiation of the role between that group and the independent oversight committee that will look at the initial stand up. Can I ask that you send uh, your rook a copy of all that once it's finalised? So we'd like to be then watching it over the next year. Yep. Yep. I was just about to turn to uh, trial sites. Um, uh, and a presentation was made to you, Rook, on the 19th of January about the trial sites, and um, I think we had it up before, it, it um, indicated that all trial sites have a general and Aboriginal-led service response. Now, when Yuruk was told on the 19th of January that all trial sites have an Aboriginal-led service response, uh, is it more accurate to say that it was planned that they would have that response? Because those 
responses were not in place or operational on the 19th of January, were they? So, yeah, so not all of them were, and um, we have partners at each of the sites. So there's a health partner and there's also a justice partner that's um, supporting the outreach team. And in some places they were still operationalising, they were still recruiting. Um, something in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> Take a moment. Yeah, sorry. There's a lot of... Um, so you know this happens. It's come with the... Yeah, I'm OK, I'm fine. So this happens all the time, I have drippy eyes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes, the um, Aboriginal-led service response in each of the sites. Yeah, so we had, um, as I said, we had this, there was two partners at each of the sites, and at most sites by January where they were operational by that stage. Um, some were still waiting on other partners or part of the service model to be standing up. Um, so we had at least some Aboriginal service operating each of the sites by that stage, but it wasn't fully operational. That's still being, um, was still underway. Now, the, your statement, um, the department statement rather, at paragraph 105 um, steps through those sites. Now, this statement was, I think, signed on March the... 21st, uh, and so at that point, the status of those sites is outlined. Uh, if we step through the four sites that are addressed in the statement, the City of Yarra at that point is expected to be operational in March 2023. What's the status of that now? Yeah, that site's fully operational. So at that stage, we did have Dadi Manwaro operating but we were still waiting on the other Aboriginal partner. Um, it was a recruitment issue. Uh, and um, in Dandenong, the Aboriginal-led service response at that the time of the statement is yet to commence operation. What's the status of that now? So, so, um, so there's still... We've got one of the Aboriginal service partners operating and the other <coughs> one's still working on recruitment and location for their staff. Uh, and Castle Maine's Aboriginal-led response at that time was not fully commenced, but it had commenced on a modified interim basis. And what's the status now? That one's operating. Fully? Yes, yeah, so it's a low demand site. So the, the key intent of Castlemaine was to test a low demand site where there's very few cases and they haven't had a single case of public intoxication yet, but they are ready when it happens. And in Shep, Shepparton, the Aboriginal led response at the point of the statement has not fully commenced, but the sobering up service had. And what's the status now? Yeah, that's fully commenced, but also they're working through their transition planning about when they'll stand down as well. Uh, sorry, I missed that in bit. Transition planning stand down? Yeah, so they're working through, so they are fully operational at the moment, and they're working through because one of the mainstream providers um, has made the decision to close early. They need to make decisions about their own operations, but they're fully operational at the moment. And is it right, uh, when you say close early, once the uh, law is changed on the 7th of November, is it right that the trial sites will no longer provide those services or will some of them continue and some not? There's potential for a small period of crossover because the trial sites were funded for a 12-month period and because of the delays in getting started, some have the option to continue a little bit further, which would create a small overlap. Um, and that's why we're working with each of the trial sites to decide whether they want to continue briefly after the statewide services stood up or whether they want to um, conclude in November. And so is it right to say that at the moment all of the First Nations specific trial sites are operating? Some, some part is operating at all sites, but there's a couple of sites where they're still recruiting transport workers, basically. Uh, so, it, it, is it possible that by the time the trial has to end, there may still be some trial services that have not commenced? I think that's very unlikely. We've been told um, very, very imminent for the couple of places where they're still recruiting. And those, those services will have less than six months of trial time? That's right. Uh, and um, for, the, um, for some period of years, it's been known that the operation of these trials would be unlikely to inform the uh, design 
of the framework because the trials would not have sufficient time to run. We've just signed a, a developmental evaluation. So the idea is it's providing real-time insights from the trial site. So the, the level of reporting is very frequent. And so, you know, while, while we wouldn't say that the trial sites had the opportunity to fully, you know, all sites reaching full maturity and a full period of evaluation, we've done our very best to try and bring those learnings in. And particularly the learnings around implementation have been um, really essential in our understanding of what it will take to commission and stand up these sites. But the reality is that from the 7th of November 2023, you will really still be learning as you go. That's right. We've had to, um, I think some people describe it as building the bike while we're riding it. Yeah. And uh, the health response will need some time before it meets its potential. I think it's fair to say that with the services operating, we will be learning as we're going, but the important thing is that those services will be in place at that time. Um, and so we expect that through the commissioning process that's underway and then working with those um, providers to have uh, workforce recruited, knowing that we have had those challenges, some of the planning system issues, um, fit out times for um, facilities. So we're, we stand ready we're, as soon as we've got those providers on board to really do what it takes to have it in place by November. But uh, you would accept that no matter how remarkable those services are, they ought not be judged their success ought not be judged in the first six months, in the first 12 months, that they will all need some time before their success can be fairly evaluated. Would you agree with that? I think the, the learning as we're going aspect is a really important point about this, that we, there'd be no judgement on those services as they're getting up and running. And we do find this um, as we're working through some of our other... Um, reforms, including in Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing and other Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system reforms, is that sometimes if it's the first time or largely the first time that you've implemented a service, that there is that um, those early stages where there's a lot of support in place if needed um, to be able to help them operate, but acknowledging that it does take time before they can really um, be in the swing of things. And I'm, I'm certainly not talking about the Department of Health judging them. I'm talking about public opinion, judging mm -hmm. them. Now, do you accept there's a real risk that detractors will use this lag in the health response becoming fully effective to say it isn't working? It's possible. And um, that replacement police powers are needed. can't comment on what some of the detractors may say, but I think, um, again, just to... It's why we're working incredibly hard to have the very best possible service response in place and working on whatever is needed to have that uh, in place, but I can't guarantee that there wouldn't be some detractors are, who say that. You are aware that Victoria Police has been lobbying for replacement police powers. They have said they need replacement police powers. I have seen that public commentary, also very aware that government um, has not um, uh, committed to any additional police powers as part of this reform, so that it is focused on the health-led response. Is it fair to say too, I think that lobbying's come from the police union, not Victoria Police as an organisation? Yeah. Um, uh, I was just going to move now to um, part of that, um, it's not public commentary, but the, um, the concerns raised by the unions, uh, the police union, the ambulance union and the health and community services union. Uh, if I could ask the operator to bring up the joint statement of those unions, which is in the witnesses folder at tab 22. And for the operator is BAL 5, 001, 0002. And if we start at page 0141,
and then move to 0142. Um, this is a, a statement put out 18 months ago by the Police Union, uh, the Health and Community Service Union and the Victorian Ambulance Union. And uh, they put out a statement in which all three of them welcomed decriminalisation. Uh, however, they considered there was a gap in the reform agenda for people who must be cared for primarily by police. Uh, are you aware of that statement? Yes. Uh, and if we can go to page, the next page on, 143, the unions um, note that for those who can't be diverted away from police holding facilities, uh, or asserted rather, that there must be effective safety measures to ensure that those people get a health response in addition to what they currently get. Does the department agree that currently the state's police holding facilities do not have the necessary infrastructure for the police to manage people in custody that are health compromised or intoxicated? I can't comment in detail around um, current police holding facilities, but I would say that given the terrible circumstances surrounding why we are working on this very reform, would suggest that they're not um, adequate. I don't know, Ms Williams, if you've got any other detail around that, but... No, look, not, not really, although it's, um, it's as much about systems and processes as it is about infrastructure, so if people need health support, that's probably a matter of diverting people to health support rather than the infrastructure itself. Are you aware of whether the state is planning on doing anything about those particular concerns raised by the unions? I don't believe so. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's any infrastructure upgrades planned as part of these reforms, but the culture change is, is really central. Uh, the unions also called for the introduction of medical monitoring technology involving camera aids that check a person's five vital signs and allow clinicians to remotely perform checks and confirm a person's safety. Are you aware of whether that measure, uh, the OxyVision camera, will be adopted? I don't believe there's work on that at this stage, but it might be better directed to Victoria Police. Uh, and... The statement by the unions also says that the police are unqualified to provide a health response and the onus should never be placed on them to provide it. Do you agree? I agree. It's not Victoria Police's role to deliver a health response, which is why we're implementing the different parts of the model through outreach teams, sobering services, um, and that... We were talking earlier about Victoria Police, if they happen to be the first responder to find someone intoxicated in public, that they would be using other techniques in trying to find um, whether that person can get to a place of safety, whether it be home or with friends, or if there is any concern around behaviour, just de-escalating the situation. So I think um, that there are... It's not a health... They're not delivering the health-led response, but they are an important party to being able to deliver that health-led response to um, people. And the unions have also called uh, for a specialist workforce to assist them to provide... Police, rather, to assist police to provide care and on-site medical assistance for people in custody, including mental health nurses, social workers and alcohol and other drugs workers and paramedics. Are you aware of whether uh, that specialist workforce to assist police on site uh, when people are in watch houses uh, will be provided? Given that people will not be taken to a police cell purely for being found intoxicated in public, that they won't have, as I understand it, won't have teams at um, police holding facilities to do the, for, to undertake those purposes. Some of those um, skill sets and qualifications will be the people that staff up the outreach teams that will be on site where someone is found um, in public. Although there will no longer be a an offence of public drunkenness or the three different offences that involve primarily being 
punishing being drunk in public, there will still be people who have allegedly committed other offences who are in holding cells, who are intoxicated. If the person has committed another offence, that may be the case. Uh, and uh, what the unions are calling for is on-site assistance of mental health nurses, social workers, alcohol and drugs workers to help them provide a health response to people who've got drug and alcohol issues but have also committed other offences. Are you aware of whether the state is considering resourcing that request? It would be considered by Justice Health. So it probably sits um, because the Department of Justice and Community Safety provides health services within correctional facilities. Um, I don't want to speculate, um, but I know there are, you know, there's always consideration of what services are appropriate, but I think it would need to be directed to the Department of Justice and Community Safety for a more complete response. Uh, I will ask you some questions about um, prisons, noting that that's not your area of primary responsibility. Before I do, I will uh, just quickly touch on the um, issue of raising the age, um, noting that it's also an area that's not of your primary responsibility, but uh, there are a number of health issues that it squarely raises. Um, on Anzac Day, the president of the Royal Australian College of Paediatricians, Jacqueline Small, came out in the press saying that many children in the youth justice system have significant neurodevelopmental disabilities and other physical and mental health needs, which are compounded by contacts with the youth justice system and incarceration. Uh, is that consistent with your understanding of the science? It's consistent with the report that I've read around, or the draft report, I should say, rather, of the Council of Attorneys General into this very issue. Um, I don't know... Um, I couldn't talk to the science, of both from my qualifications but also the Department of Health role um, in this um, work has not been to provide that medical specialist scientific input, but we'll accept your statement about the, um, the challenges that many young people find themselves in if they're in the system. So is it right to say that the Department of Justice has never sought advice from the Department of Health in relation to those issues? Not specifically the Department of Health other than when it was briefing government on the decision around ageing the... Um, sorry, raising the age. Uh, and, Operator, if we could bring up the draft report um, that uh, the witness was just mentioning, which is... Uh, BAL 5 0001 0002 0001. Tab 23 is your file. Uh, as the witnesses mentioned, this is a draft report prepared for the Council of Attorneys General Age of Criminal Responsibility Working Group. Uh, if we could go to page 51 of that report, which is 0051. Uh, in that report, there was consideration of the developmental science uh, in the area. And finding three of the report is that a child under the age of 14 years is unlikely to understand the impact of their actions and to comprehend criminal proceedings. And is that finding accepted by the department? This report was produced for a Commonwealth state working group. Oh, sorry, it was developed by a working group to go to the Council of Attorneys General. So the Department of Health hasn't expressed a view, it hasn't come to us in any formal capacity to provide a comment. Uh, and um, do you know why it is that your 
expertise, the department's expertise in relation to health, health issues, developmental issues, mental health issues has not been sought by the Department of Justice in this reform process? I think because this work was undertaken by a national working group that it's not unusual in Commonwealth state relations type work that the Council of Attorneys General and the working group and the Victorian member was from the Department of Justice and Community Safety that they would be developing that report through, and you can see through the report there's lots of stakeholder consultation and consultation with experts, including some medical experts, to come up with that advice. So it wouldn't be unusual that a process like this didn't specifically seek out the Department of Health's view until it came to the time of briefing government around a proposal. And is it equally right to say that the Department of Health has not was not consulted on the, propo the proposal to raise the age to 12 rather than 14? The Department of Health um, provided advice to our ministers at the time that government was being briefed on the proposal um, for raising the age to 12 and then ultimately or down the track to 14. Uh, your, you provided advice to your ministers, but you were not consulted before the proposal, choosing an age, was decided upon. I'm being a bit careful because it relates to briefings to Cabinet, so I think that's why I'm being perhaps just a, a little bit careful. But it is the case that as departments are preparing submissions for government decision-making that they do go through a consultation process to develop that. So we will have provided some comment as part of that and then we briefed our ministers for when the conversation was being undertaken by government. But if I can just, um, I suppose, cut to the end point. Um, the it wasn't the Department of Health that proposed 12 as an appropriate age of criminal responsibility. No, we did not. Uh, if we can now uh, just turn to... Are you provided advice from a health perspective, holistic health perspective, to that process? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I was now just going to move to the final topic that I wanted to address, Commissioners, which is prisons. Sorry, um, Mr Chair, I'm just looking at um, the ballot work. And you actually have the case for change in here and you talk about Aboriginal children and young people and that there is a continued over-representation of Victorian Aboriginal young people subject to youth justice and supervision and detention, with Aboriginal young people more likely to offend earlier um, and in brackets age 14 for Aboriginal people compared to 19 for non-Aboriginal people. And just also looking at this around the wellbeing that you've got in this around um, our, our, our youth um, and self-determination and being connected to culture and having forensic care and all these things and and yet we're only raising it to 12. Like, I'm just really confused about it. If you look at this document, it's really saying that our kids need help and we're not prepared to give it to them. Like, I don't understand that you can have a framework, an Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing framework, who I add, you've taken the time of leaders in these areas of social and emotional wellbeing of Aboriginal people to do this. It's not been evaluated. In there it's saying that we need much more support for our young people, yet there's no action on it. I think the action that has been taken with um, Ballot Murrup and some of the other work that we're doing in response to the Royal Commission is around the, in the prevention and early intervention space. So I accept that we do see that there are still um, children and young people who are involved in child protection and the criminal justice system. So we recognise that a lot of the work and certainly with the responsibilities that I have in the department, it is trying to focus much more on um, the supporting Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing to have strong, um, strong families, strong children, um, connected to culture so that they're not interacting with those services. So thinking about the, the role that we can play in... But there's also a, a, 
the part where you've got the majority, you've got high rates of kids going into care in juvenile justice that need mental health. And by this, you understand the development of children. I'm not sure if you know any 12-year-olds, but think about their capacity of right for wrong. Think about this that you've written and think about them being locked up away from their parents. I think that's the point that we're missing, their children. Um, moving to um, health and, and um, also, also youth justice, um, you are not responsible for um, the health care that uh, the kids that um, we're talking about will receive when they're in a juvenile justice facility, are you? No, it's um, overseen by Justice Health, which is a business unit in the Department of Justice and Community Safety. So why is that... Sorry, I, I just need to ask, why is that a second... I'm not understanding, it seems to be these silos. So why would you not have Department of Health together? What is that? Why is that this separate? I can't speculate on the decision for why Justice Health um, sits in the Department of Justice and Community Safety, but I understand that there was a view at the time that health was really disconnected um, with the justice system and so the idea of having a business unit inside justice and community safety was trying to bring health and justice together. I don't think that's worked very well, but we can bring that up at a later. Uh, and... Um uh, it's, it's often said, uh, and there was evidence in uh, the Nelson inquiry about this, that prisoners get the same care for their health as the rest of us. Um, because prisoners are detained and cannot generally leave prison to access the health services that you manage or external health services, their health needs are not provided uh, by your department, but rather by different private health contractors in each prison, is that right? So Justice Health oversees delivery. There are um, currently some private health services that deliver those services in prisons. There have been some changes and, for example, from the 1st of July this year, there will now be a public health service, so Western Health will be providing uh, health services into the Dame Phyllis, um, Phyllis Frost Centre. And uh, are you aware of uh, why the decision has been made to replace a private health provider with a public health provider in Dame Phyllis Frost? I couldn't comment on that, I'm afraid. Uh, and um, are you aware uh, that... Uh, in his, I, I, I just had a word um, from solicitor assisting your honour that we have received the um, that the coroner's court has provided us with the state's response to uh, coroner McGregor's uh, findings and recommendations. I was just going to ask a couple of questions about coroner McGregor's recommendations. It, it might be useful if we stood down for five minutes and we could find out um, what the state's response was so that I'm not um, uh, putting these things to the witness in a vacuum. Yeah. Would it suit the commissioners to... Apparently, solicitors assisting say we also um, will be without noise until 1pm so that um, I ho hope that five minutes doesn't jeopardise our peace. I'm fine by that. Mm. Yep. I'm fine. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So, five minutes? Just a five minute break to read um, this statement. Turn to 1026. <laughs> 1226, sorry. Want to know what it says? We just took a short break to um, obtain the government response to Coroner McGregor's findings. Now, I assume that as, um, as a uh, senior bureaucrat in the Department of Health, you were already aware of what the Department of Health's response was going to be in this letter um, before. So I'm hoping that the fact that you haven't had a good chance to read this from cover to cover won't hamper our 
the, I think, what are fairly high level questions, but let me know if you need to read it. Um, but I'm hoping there are no surprises for you in this about what the Department of Health is doing. Would that be fair to say? No major surprises, <laughs> no. Um, uh, so you are aware, of course, that in his recommendations in the Veronica Nelson inquest, Coroner McGregor found that the death of Ms Nelson as a result of complications of withdrawal from chronic opiate use and Wilkie syndrome in the setting of malnutrition was preventable and inhumane. I'm aware of that. Uh, and the coroner also found that Ms Nelson had received inadequate medical treatment while in Dame Phyllis Frost Women's Prison. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of that finding. Ms Fitzgerald, do you mind if I just do again acknowledge that we're talking about something very sensitive and the, the coroner's um, findings, but we're talking about um, the very sad circumstance of the passing of Veronica Nelson. So I just want to acknowledge that and also um, it is challenging and also um, to express my condolences to the Nelson family. Um, one of the coroner's recommendations uh, is that the Department of Health and the Department of Justice should consult to determine from a clinical perspective which of you should have oversight of health care within prisons. Mm. Uh, and are you able to provide the department's response to that recommendation? I can, and that is, it's set out in the response here, at so recommendation 19.1, and we say as part of the government's response that that recommendation will be implemented and that implementation has commenced. Now, recommendation 19.1 um, recommends consult to determine. So I'd say that there is um, Department of Health and Department of Justice and Community Safety are in discussions at the moment about the best mechanism to undertake that consultation. So it's very early stages um, and that consultation yet to commence. Uh, and just uh, uh, going back to recommendation two, uh, Coroner McGregor recommended that the government in consultation with Victoria Police, the Department of Justice, the Department of Health and Peak Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander organisations urgently develop a review and implementation strategy for the state's implementation of the 339 recommendations of the 1991 final report in, of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Um, what's your understanding of the uh, Department of Health's response to that? I can't comment on that. We will have... Um will be party to those um, discussions, but I personally just, I'm not sure where the discussion's up to, but could seek that As out. As you understand help. it, the state has uh, indicated that it will implement an alternative to the coroner's recommendation and that implementation has commenced. It does say that and I'll say that I am generally across this response, but not the detail around what that alternative is without uh, reading it in more detail. Uh, there is um, a recommendation about auditing and scrutiny of custodial health care services to ensure that it's independent, comprehensive, transparent, regular, designed to enhance the health, wellbeing and safety outcomes for Victorian prisoners, designed to ensure custodial healthcare services are delivered in a manner that's consistent with charter obligations and that the implementation of any recommendations for improved practice identified by the system for auditing and scrutiny is monitored. And uh, is, it, is it right that at the moment uh, Justice Health is scoping the design for the new model for auditing custodial health services. Ms Fitzgerald, would you mind saying which recommendation you're referring to? I'm sorry, I've, I'm on, there are no page numbers. I'm on recommendation 18, which is... Oh, I see. Page 8. Page 8. I'm 
seeing this response, I would have to say that, that if the Department of Justice and Community Safety is saying that that's the work that it's going to do um, and is going to implement it, that that will be the case. I'm not aware of other work around um, that recommendation at this stage. You, and you're not aware of any work that the Department of Health will be doing in, that, in relation to that recommendation? I don't but I can seek out that information if it would be assist, if it would assist. Yes, thank you, it would. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last recommendation that I think touches upon anything to do with the Department of Health is recommendation 38. Uh, Coroner McGregor recommended that the Department of Health, in collaboration with relevant Aboriginal community controlled health organisations and other stakeholders, prioritise the design, establishment and adequately resource a culturally safe, gender-specific residential rehab facility for Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander women with drug and alcohol dependence. Uh, now, the response indicates that this recommendation is under consideration. Do you understand why the department has not accepted this recommendation fully? This recommendation will say that it's under consideration because there's, um, for two reasons. One, there's work underway at the moment to undertake mental health and wellbeing service, service planning and capital planning, and that extends or will extend to alcohol and other drug services as well. So that work's underway and it's in response to the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. It's something that has not been done well in the past. So there's that work about service and capital planning but also that this would, to stand up a centre like this, um, would require funding, um, and so it would be subject to um, future government consideration of funding. Commissioners, those were the questions that I had for these witnesses. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at um, the health, the health.vic.gov. You've got um, here, it's called the... Um, alcohol and other drug treatment principles. And I just, you know, there's, a, there's quite a few of them, but one of them is um, the, the treat, uh, where is it, sorry, that the uh, treatment involves integrated and holistic care, treatment system provides it for continuity of care, treatment is person-centred, so that's your stance as health. So how, and evidence we've heard, in prison do women getting admitted that have to go through detox, uh, they get a detox pack and they get two, a day of Valium for two days and then it tapers off to one Valium, which is a total of six days on. Is that treatment person-centred? I couldn't speak to that. I don't have the expertise to... But you would say that it's so every woman that comes in, that's not centred around the person or holistic of the person. Would you agree with that? That every woman gets the same? I th I'd accept that there'll be people with different needs and that that may not be suitable in all circumstances. So, yes, you agree it's not suitable? Not necessarily in all circumstances. You know that... No one should die in the care of the state because of detox. They are detoxing. No one. Not one single person. Yet we've got one health response here by Department of Health and then we get another level of care by Justice Health. So how can the government give us two different forms of advice for how you are treated... So you're saying if you're not, you're not incarcerated, this is what you get. If you're incarcerated, you get less than. Because that's, that's what it says to me. There may be some nuance around that. I'm just not aware because it is, um, sits with... Um, but how, does, how does a re... Uh, what do they call it? A, a pack, a, with, a standard withdrawal pack. How does that, for every woman that comes in... And we've heard this as evidence. And then you've got all this treatment centred. We've also heard that women that have mental illness that are incarcerated 
are being taken off and put on different medication or it's not available to them because no one's told them it's there to be picked up or, oh, you've run out. So this, this advice, and, and from what I see and reading this, does not work, it does not, does not, um, how do I put it, is for someone that isn't incarcerated. So if you're incarcerated, you get a different service system. Can't. They're still in state care. They're under the care of the state. No one should die from detoxing. No one. Thank you. Is, oh, Jens? Look, I, I've just got a statement. I read and reread your response, and uh, look, thank you for your testimony today. But I have to say how disappointing I found this response. It had almost nothing of substance in it, to my reading, and it was really full of platitudes and. Uh, vague aspirational statements issued without any enabling mechanism attached to them. So it, it was very disappointing. So thank you for your evidence to clarify some of the things that weren't in here. Did you want to say? Yeah, I've got one final question. Um, is there anything you would like to say to First Peoples families watching today, uh, particularly those who... Um, may have been affected uh, by the issues discussed today and the, the limitations within um, the system that has ultimately led to, um, you know, continued trauma of our people at the hands of the system. Thanks for that opportunity, Commissioner Lovett. I would say a couple of things. So in representing the Department of Health today, I do want to acknowledge the past harms that have um, been experienced by First Peoples, but also there are current harms that are still being experienced by First Peoples, and that the importance of having a culturally safe health and wellbeing um, system and supporting social and emotional wellbeing is um, an important part of addressing intergenerational trauma. I would say that we are working hard as a department um, to implement. Um, so I think today we have talked about quite a few things about planning for things and things in the future. But I would say that we are implementing a number of changes and some of those have been recommended by the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system and really around that support for social and emotional wellbeing to seek to prevent and intervene early um, so that um, First Peoples don't have to interact with the child protection system or the criminal justice system. And then also that as we implement the health-led model to public intoxication, that we are seeking to work closely with First Peoples for those accountability points that you've raised about monitoring evaluation and being sure that they are delivering for First Peoples. And just acknowledging again that without the tireless advocacy over 30 years that we may not be where we are to be implementing those reforms. Um, so just, I guess, in closing, just acknowledging how much deep listening that we are needing to, but also action, and I hear that very clearly um, from the Commission. So grateful for the opportunity to present today and that we are um, working hard to try and um, achieve some better outcomes for First Peoples in Victoria. Evan, did you want to yes, I've got a few questions. Thank you. Uh, Firstly, uh, a series of questions about human rights. I believe I know the answers to these questions, uh, but I just want to get them on the record. Uh, and as I understand uh, uh, your department's uh, uh, policy standpoint, you accept uh, that human rights are fundamental to practically everything that you do. Yes. Uh, and you acknowledge uh, that uh, you are charter-bound and just about every officer within the entirety of your operations is bound by the Charter. Yes. Uh, I understand also that you um, acknowledge and take seriously that there are other sources of human rights, um, the Disability Convention, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, UNDRIP, uh, which specify human rights that you need to take seriously and take into account. Yes. The uh, Royal Commission uh, recently uh, produced 
the large report to which you've referred, uh, and that report generally called for uh, an alignment between human rights obligations uh, and outcomes with respect to the mental health system. Uh, and that's, that's a report that you've accepted and that you're attempting to implement. Yes. Uh, in relation to the um, to recent reforms uh, in uh, of the Mental Health Act, uh, those reforms were intended uh, to reflect that recommendation specifically about the relationship between mental health outcomes and human rights. Yes. It's uh, that's not the end of the road, though, is it? There is more uh, for you to go. There is further for you to, for you to go towards that objective. Yes, there absolutely is. Um, I'm uh, interested to know uh, about the, the, the specificity uh, of uh, the operation of the system with respect to uh, Aboriginal people. Uh, and I'm, I think I can approach this subject this way. Is, is it your aspiration uh, that the, uh, the mental health needs uh, the support that's required uh, and uh, the, the human rights with respect to mental health of Aboriginal people are going to be met within mainstream services or in the longer run uh, do you accept that they should be met within Aboriginal controlled services consistently with the principle of self-determination? Certainly um, in line with self-determination, the we talked earlier in the hearing today about No Wrong Door mm -hmm. and the aspiration of the Royal Commission and the one that the Government and the Department of Health has adopted is that no matter where First Peoples seek out support for mental health and AOD, that they could approach their ATCHO, ACCO or their mainstream health service and should receive a culturally safe respectful, inclusive service. So the idea is that it, it should be any door that First Peoples yes. can go to. Now that, um, that implies, uh, does it not, uh, a serious upscaling of cultural competence uh, among uh, providers of treatment, care and support in the mainstream. W would you accept that proposition? I do. And, and so the, there's a natural question to ask um, if there is a need for significant upscaling of that competence, uh, what, what are you doing in order to bring that about? So there's current work and there's future work. So the, in the current settings we have as a, when we were the Department of Health and Human Services, um, so in 2019, there's a framework, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Cultural Safety Framework that was developed. And that is to um, set out um, uh, objectives and um, aspirations for health services and other funded organisations by the then DHHS. It is still um, a framework that we use in the Department of Health. And at the moment, um, there are cultural safety um, <coughs> uh, obligations maybe um, the right language in health services statements of priority and they undertake uh, training and um, it's also a part of the performance management framework when the department talks with health services about their performance. I say that, that that's the current setting because it's not, um, it's not sufficient and I think we've absolutely acknowledged that and I was referring earlier to the Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing um, partnership forum and the agreement and the action plan and the action plan that I mentioned earlier it is still in draft form but it has been developed um, with our ATCHOs and that there are priorities in that action plan for the next two years about that upscaling that you've talked about and so recognising that it's not um, sufficient, nowhere near at the mm -hmm. moment. We do still hear lots of um, stories of First Peoples facing mm -hmm. Um, racism and bias and yep. they're not culturally safe services so it is an area that we're really um, prioritising for um, our work over the next little while. Thank you. 
Uh, who's managing that project at the moment? Is there a, uh, is there a, a mechanism of engagement with First Peoples in, so that they're involved? So that's who's done the project design and so on? So the work um, that to come up with that action in the action plan, it's been a um, process of the department working with ACOs, who are the forum members, so the um, yep. Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing Partnership Forum. So it's been developed um, together. I don't. I think the details are now being worked through about what that actually means in terms of training, how you then hold people to account for having done the training, what they learnt from the training and what they apply from the training. So there's a, a fair bit to go in terms of the design, but it's um, we're hoping very soon will be um, not draft and that it will be agreed as the that's the action and that we as um, senior leaders in the Department of Health have agreed at our executive board that we will... Um, undertake the necessary prioritisation of work and resourcing in the department to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, one uh, next, next question category, uh, and that is that uh, within the mainstream, uh, one uh, mechanism for addressing the shortfall in availability of treatment, care and support identified by the Royal Commission uh, is the rollout of the Headspace network so that people under the age of 25, 27, I can't remember the date now, um, with mental health, is health issues are able to uh, go to a shop front uh, and obtain assistance. Uh, is that a fair description? It is, and Headspace is a service that's um, run by the Commonwealth Government but works in with the yes. broader system in Victoria. Do you, um, do you know whether anybody is monitoring uh, the... Uh, the the uptake uh, by young Aboriginal people of access to HESPO services? I imagine so. Yeah. It would be the Commonwealth Government. It would be the Commonwealth. Yes. So I couldn't ask you about that, I guess. Not in detail. I'm Not in detail. It. it might be something that you, you think about, um, because obviously uh, this has state implications. Yes. Now, the last question a category is to do uh, with com compulsory treatment criteria. Uh, you have established uh, a, uh, an independent review of compulsory treatment uh, criteria uh, headed up by Justice Marshall, uh, mm -hmm. having a team of people, including people with lived experience of mental yes. ill health. Uh, and it is currently engaged in a consultation uh, process uh, around reforms uh, legal and administrative that might be implemented to bring about a reduction, preferably down to nothing, but we shall see, uh, of compulsory treatment. Uh, do you know what uh, steps are being taken by that uh, independent review to ensure um, that uh, First Peoples uh, engage in that consultation and ensure that their voice is heard, uh, remembering the over-representation among First Peoples of mental ill health. Thank you for that question. I might just see, Ms Williams, do you have any information about that point? That the independent review panel are developing up their consultation strategy at the moment, in line, but they also have, as you said, um, a consultation process on Engage Victoria, which is available now. So there's an opportunity for First Peoples to feed in, but we are very much managing it as an independent review panel, so it is arm's length, so I couldn't say specifically, but we could make a request of that panel to provide information to you um, on, on that particular question. I think it, it would be of great interest, yep. um, because compulsory treatment is a very serious human rights issue, yep. Yep. Uh, which um, uh, Aboriginal people experience to a much greater extent, consistent with their over-representation in the system generally. So, yeah, I, I would welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're all done. Council, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why I'm thanking you because it's all so distressing and it reminds us the past is just, just there all the time for us and that our people uh, are almost subject to whatever latest strategy or framework is in play, not necessarily the current one, by the way, but the one that's coming. So uh, it's, uh, it's quite distressing from that point of view. But thank you very much for being, uh, being able to provide the answers to the questions we've got and we 
we'll have more, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor. If I may, Chair, I tender into evidence uh, the following documents uh, referable uh, to the evidence of Catherine Wetton and Eleanor Williams. Firstly, uh, uh, Exhibit 2.1.1, the Department of Health Statement dated the 21st of March 2023. Uh, the 2.1.2, .2, the annotated bibliography, Annexure A, and other documents that I have referred to today from Exhibits 2.1.3 through to 2.1.9. Thank you, Council. They will be allocated the next exhibit numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We've now concluded today's evidence. Thank you. We can now adjourn. Adjourn. Thank you. And we'll be uh, resuming tomorrow morning, I understand, at 10 o'clock.